Hey there folks, welcome to episode 5 of the story of Moz. Um, look, after two years of working underground, I decided that enough was enough, you know. The, the novelty had worn off um, and I wanted to get up to the surface, do some work there. So, I'd gotten to know the winder drivers. Um, they're the guys that actually operate the, the winder that I was working on. Um, reasonably well and they'd offered to train me up as a winder driver uh, so uh, over six months um, they took me on I filled in the log books I did all this in my own time not in company time uh, the I made the applications to the mines department they accepted the application and uh, away I went after six months I got my ticket as a winder driver then in, oh, I think it was beginning of 1985 that um, a position became available in the winder room uh, when a, one of the drivers had left. So I was taken on as a winder driver. Um, so this is the story of Moz the winder driver. Let me tell you a story about a man named Moz who travelled in this country named Oz. Then one day he stopped in this town, got a job in mining and worked underground. Base metal ore, that is. Copper lead zinc. Alrighty then, the um, operation of a friction winder I've already explained in, I think it was episode 2. So no need, no need to really go through all that again. Um, you can see the uh, posters on the wall here behind me. That's uh, my influence to the decor of the winder room. The winder itself, uh, it's a fully automatic uh, winder for both ore hoisting and as an elevator for uh, getting the guys in, or in and out of the mine. Um, the winder driver himself is basically there to undertake safety checks at the start of the shifts, uh, safety checks before any uh, persons ride in the, in the cage, um, generally to monitor how things are operating and to take over if there was any intervention required in manuals, manual mode. Um, even operating during uh, shaft inspections and all that sort of thing. I think I've talked about uh, shaft inspections on, in episode 2. So that was uh, in essence the, the uh, duties of the winder driver. Um, as you can see behind me here this is the head drum. Uh, there on, on the attached to the head drum is a DC motor. It's an overhung armature motor, meaning that there's no bearing on the back of the motor. The main drive bearing is between the head drum and the motor itself, and the armature just hangs over the top of that. Pretty strong motor to carry all that weight and do all that duty, and, the, and at the speed. Um, so, yeah, it was a uh, yeah, pretty good uh, operation, that one. Uh, you can see here behind me, uh, there's a little... Uh, dynamo with a wheel up against the ropes that um, actually run over the top of the head drum. This monitors the the speed of the ropes and it's in synchronous with the the motor itself and the, and the operation of the winder so if it goes out of sync it, it detects rope slip. So um, if that happens uh, the winder shuts down and that's where the winder driver comes in and starts getting it into position. Um, as you can see behind me here, this is the uh, winder control room uh, where I spent most of my time when on, on shift or all the time when I'm on shift. Um, and here is the uh, captain's chair. That's the uh, main control area for the winder operator. You can do all functions of the winder from there. Um, interesting to note, you see the, uh, the modern analog telephone. Um, not pretty rarely seen nowadays and over on the other side you can see um, 
hey, my reading material, something to do during the shift uh, while everything's running in automatic and running very smooth. Um, this picture here behind me now is the actual winder control panel uh, sitting in the, the chair. You can see all that that's going on with the winders going up, down, what weights are in the skips, um, any of the alarms, everything is centralised there. Here's a picture of young Moz on duty. Um, if you're observant, you can see that the uh, the clock says about uh, between 5 and 10 past 1. Uh, that's AM. I was on night shift at the time. So that's me uh, on the job, you might say. You know, I did mention that it's fully automatic. And um, as such, it got pretty boring in that uh, winder room. And... You know, I've read a number of novels and and the likes, and uh, I decided to take on a course through correspondence, and I actually completed um, the first year of an electrical engineering course through correspondence in that winder room. So, yeah, there you, there you have it. That's. Uh, you needed something to do and that was my way of uh, passing the time. Anyhow, t towards the end of that I, I did finish the first year uh, but then in 1987, I think it was beginning of 87 or thereabouts, uh, an opportunity came up um, to go into the uh, processing plant as a metallurgist so I applied for that and lo and behold, I got that job too. So I moved on from there into the wind house. So in a nutshell, that's that was my time as a winder driver. So yeah, I um, mean, pretty brief, but yeah, just explained what uh, how I progressed and moved on into back into my original field. So for now, oh, before I forget. Um, the challenge from the last episode, you can see behind me here, this was uh, the challenge uh, to identify what this boat was made of. And um, Mario was the first to identify the components of this boat. Um, and the components of this boat were the bonnets or hoods, if you're in America, of an F.J. Holden, uh, 1953 to 1957 series sedan. It was actually um, the second model of the all Australian made uh, Holdens or cars uh, at the time. Uh, the previous model to that was the FX. So there you go. There's a picture of the, the car. Um, and um, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's it. And Hope you join me in the next episode of uh, Moz the Metallurgist. And I'll see you next time. Oh, before I go, um, seeing as I've got a little bit of time up my sleeve, I'd like to um, just tell a story, uh, which I didn't include in um, the last episode of Storytime. Uh, and I'll show, I'll, I've included it in now so you can have a look and get a laugh out of it if you think it's funny. And I certainly thought it was rather amusing. So um, hope you watch this uh, little story to the end. And uh, at the end of all that, cheers. It involves uh, gate meetings. Now, I don't know if you know what a gate meeting is. It's basically a union term. Um, when there's a stop work meeting, called. Uh, you can't have hold a stop work meeting on site. So at this operation being a number of kilometres out of town, um, the place to do it was in the car park, just outside the gate, hence the term gate meeting. I remember this one particular day, and not only one particular, it happened a few times, but you know, when a meeting's called at 
7 o'clock in the morning normally on a Friday yes a Friday there's a reason for that um, you arrive or arrive at work on the bus and look around at the car park and you see in the car park you see a number of boats hooked up to cars for drives ready to go fishing and uh, when you see that you know that a long weekend was coming normally the Friday would be a day off then your normal Saturday and Sunday but the return to work meeting wouldn't be called till about Tuesday so there you have it I found those things very amusing that they always happened on a Friday it was the 80s you know there was all this sort of stuff going on so yeah that was rather humorous I thought